This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Dan. This Stone. is Dexter from The this Offspring. Is Nathan this East. is Sebastian Younger. This is David Lab. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. I'm Christopher This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. I'm Laird Hamilton. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, I'm Mark Valley. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, this is John. Hey, this is Pete A. Turner. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero, Mark Valley, and Pete A. Turner. At, well, we're at Pete's house. That's right. And we are enjoying our NAM show week. A lot slash of reflecting. Weekend. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the NAM show done wore us out. <laughs> There's two more days of this thing, man. And I don't know that I can take any more. If it didn't wear us out, it definitely wore parts of my body out. Yeah. I had to tap out on that Yamaha concert last night because my back and my legs, my feet. We had just been on our feet all day long and we were standing on that hard ass pavement. Yeah, hustling. There's so much. That Yamaha concert last night consisted of uh, an enormous uh, band Mm -hmm. with a full horn section. I believe there were strings, there were singers, and they were directed musically. By our friend Nathan East. Show guest number. You got a number for me? No. <laughs> you, can't, you can't pull. Sometimes you get good at that. I have a number for you. I'll grab that while we're talking. Uh, but Nathan East has, of course, been a Yamaha artist for the length of his career. And he is just beloved at Yamaha. So when they throw a big concert like this, and he's available, God only knows how on earth he's available. Does he book that time out knowing that he's – because Yamaha is a local brand. Yeah. So does he just say, I need to be part of this? Yeah. As NAMM show was this weekend. We know when it is. His, yeah. His client or his, his boss or whatever. Because they've been working on that show for a while, clearly. For sure. He's been working with that band for a while. Yeah. You don't just show up that day and start playing. No. Yeah. No, but you do show up that month and start playing. It doesn't yeah. require more than – they probably did that whole thing in – Three rehearsals. That's true, but that does take time for a guy that tours all over the world. Right. And he was guest number 155. 155, Nathan East. We're on 218 right now and accelerating. Holy cow. So he is uh, one of the very wonderful friends that we've made doing this show. And to witness his work last night was uh, spectacular. Right. The uh, show included... Who did that show include? Lindsey Sterling, Mark Broussard, Butch Walker. Yeah. Melissa Etheridge. That's right. And, uh, Michael McDonald. Yeah. And I, that's, that's as true. much as we know. Yeah, because we had, we had actually went on to record Because it was a secret and we bailed. <laughs> yeah. Well, we didn't bail. We went on to go work. We had an uh, interview to do. Yeah, that's true. With the Wesonator. The Wesonator. And he was fantastic. He I sure wait. is. Cannot yeah. wait for you guys to hear that show. What a great guy, man. I love that dude. Yeah. Wesonator.com. W-E-S-O Nader.com. Yeah. And, and we're talking about Wes Maybe. We're not maybe talking about Wes. We're talking about Wes Maybe. <laughs> He's a producer, engineer, uh, front of the house guy sometimes. Yeah. Just an engineer extraordinaire, man. That guy's got a bundle of knowledge in his head that... Is a lot of fun. And he's totally cool. He is. He's got, and he didn't tell this story on mic, but he's got a great Bruce Foxton story. Mm-hmm. And if you know who Bruce is, you know that he's a little bit of a salty guy. Wes has the chops to uh, bark back a little bit at the talent because. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, we can make this easy or we can make this difficult. <laughs> yeah. And it's not just that he has the chops. He's got the demeanor. He's really a a great interactor. Yeah. I mean, some of the chops that it takes to do a gig of that size mm-hmm. are certainly impressive. But when they're paired up with a guy who can just create a space for the artist to do their best work, and then when the artist needs a little kick in the, you know, wherever they need a kick. Right. A guy who can deliver that and deliver it with, you know, firmness, but in service to the product. I just, man, I just found him to be a great guy. And then really, it's from what the impression that we got from him. Yes, a, a boot in the butt might be the right thing. But he said a couple of times, I'm going to turn the lights down, mm-hmm. get you into the right mood. Yeah. Why don't you tell me about your mama? Right. And that draws the song out, which is also his job. Like, it, where is that perfect sound? It's not just in a knob. No, it's not in the knob at all. The knob comes secondary. Mm-hmm. So... 
Yeah, that's going to be cool. That is going to be cool. Uh, before we get started, too, I just want to do a little commercial for the Laird Coffee Creamer because, man, we've been drinking this turmeric creamer. Yeah, it's so good. And it is wonderful. Thank you, Laird. Will, yeah, thank you, Laird. And I will say this, this – we purchased this. Mm -hmm. This is my Christmas gift that we're consuming. So this is not like Laird gave us money or gave us free product. Yeah. Legitimately drink it and glad to pay Laird f money for it. We yeah. didn't take free from him because I want him to do well. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're supporting his product. Hey, let's face it, man. The guy works hard to uh, create stuff that's good for you. Yeah. He admitted to us that I'm trying to get this right. Yeah. You know, I, I know that some of the time I'm going to get it right. Some of the time not. I'm going to miss the mark a little bit, but. Let's do what we can yeah. to eat better and live better and all that stuff. And we want to support all that. Also, the shit is delicious. It's so good. Yeah. Anyway. Let's talk a little bit about the Grammys. That's topical. Yeah. It's we, topical because it, it sort of messed with us this year. Na th you know, this NAMM show has been has been pretty good. I mean, we saw Bootsy yesterday. We saw, we've seen a few people. But in, in years past, uh, I've managed to see and meet really a lot more people than than I did this year. And I don't know if it's because I'm walking slower, <laughs> but I don't think that is. One of the reasons is that the show is just enormous. I mean, good God. We're averaging just shy of 20,000 steps a day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a lot of stepping. Yeah. Yeah. The show is mammoth. And I don't know, there's not that many places on earth they can go to that are bigger and be organized in a place where people would want to go to show. I mean, I'm sure you can go off in a field out in the steppes in Asia, you know, put up a bunch of tents. But this isn't a nomad show. This is a music show. They need to be near a certain things. Right. Like electricity. <laughs> yes. But it is it is an epic expo of all things music. Where yeah. you are a buyer, a vendor, mm -hmm. a performer. Us, like press people all over the place. Yeah. we. I walked within inches of George Clinton last night, and he was walking around like a dude at a conference. Yeah. He wasn't walking around. He was for sure walking around with a whole group of people. Yeah. And the guy instance, travels like a king. <laughs> yeah. In this instance, he was just a dude, you know, looking at cool shit. Yeah. Well, the other thing is that his while you were walking next to George Clinton, I was trying to get to Bootsy Collins and that guy. It's a zoo everywhere he goes, man. Yeah. It's just you can't get within eh, everybody everybody wants a piece of Bootsy. We're trying to get Bootsy on the show. We're trying to get George on the show, but you know, those guys are tough to Yeah corral. It's, it's not at all that they won't come on. It's just, you know, we have to get everything to and we have so many stories we're already yeah. trying to tell. We've got some incredible people lined up. We do. It's just getting the planets to align with those guys. I mean, even when you're in the same room with them, it's you, tough to make the planets you can't align. Get near, yeah, I can't get near them. Yeah. yeah, for sure. But I want to talk about, uh, before we get to the, the Grammys, I want to talk about the NAMM show because we did make some wonderful friends at, at the NAMM show. I want to just shout out to Mio Flores, who I saw yesterday. Uh, we ran into each other in front of the uh, Sabian booth. I wanted to run into him in front of LP or something so I could uh, just jam with him a little bit. Right. Uh, and I witnessed him jamming. He put up a Facebook Live post, and he was part of a big impromptu uh, Latin percussion jam that happened, but not while we were there. One of the things you see at NAM is you see musicians not – you definitely see them being performers, like when we saw the uh, the Dane that was playing the guitar and shredding like those Northern European guys do. Yeah. But then you also see Flavor Flav just being lost in his piano and playing, and he's not playing for anyone nope. but himself. Yeah. He's just sat down at a piano because there was one there. Mm -hmm. And who knew Flavor Flav could play piano like that? Yeah, he was doing it. I did not. And I can see that. Like, he doesn't have to be in that moment. He can be, I don't know, whatever his name is, Rob. Yeah. You know, he can just be Rob, the guy that loves to play the piano and just, you know, he's still, he's going to be Flavor Flav to anybody outside of his persona. Right. But inside, he's just the dude that likes to play the piano. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Who else do we want to acknowledge? We made friends at Audio Technica. Yeah, we made like friends at Zoom. Zoom, those guys are cool. Yeah, yeah, those guys are cool. There's, well, you know what? They're all cool. There were so many neat people to talk to. Yeah, all, especially like we talked to some folks at Sennheiser. Mm -hmm. We talked to a lot of folks at. I talked to folks at Cala Ukulele. Mm -hmm. 
and we're going to do a little feature on them because they're up in Petaluma. Mm-hmm. And they make a tremendous product, and they have a wonderful roster of artists, and it's a ukulele. So yeah. when you got a roster of 20 ukulele players endorsing your instrument, yeah, those guys are going to be cool. Yeah, they are cool. You know, you, I don't think you can... I don't know that it's possible that you can be a dick and play the ukulele. It's not possible. Those two things can't go together. Yeah. So one of the things about podcasting is we're, we're sort of a broadcast media conference you know, goer, but then again, we're also in the music industry because of how we do it and what we do. Right. We're sort of recording artists. So they're like, not really sure what to do with us. Yeah. And so even though we're there as a, in a media capacity, when we show up and say, hey, tell us about your mic setup so we can find the industry standard what's there, it's it's interesting to see, see them go, oh, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so the NAM folks were great in allowing us to come as a legitimate media arm, and we definitely are delivering on that one thing, this show for sure, but also the, the West show, and, and there's so many things. I wanted to, without derailing our Grammy conversation, because I really do want to have that, I wanted to touch on AI and music in the future, because it's incredible. what This is going to be on the pop, popping the bubble stuff too, but let's talk a little bit about machine learning and augmented, if not artificial intelligence. Let's talk in terms of augmented intelligence. If you as a composer, or if you want to become a composer and you don't have a mastery of, you're not a multi-instrumentalist and everything, within a very short amount of time, you'll be able to compose good music. I don't know that compose is the right word, but yeah, you'll be able to assemble good music. I so think more the like way a that, DJ, you think, then? Well... A little more like a DJ, yeah, in that you're a curator okay. of sounds and musical phrases. And um, yeah. there's a lot of that going on now because when you think about Kanye West, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I love Kanye West's work. Yeah. He is a he is a curator. Are we getting comfortable with that line moving then? Is that what we're having to do? Because Well, we're gonna have to get comfortable right, with no. it moving because it's moving. <laughs> It's moving because I don't want to in any way like you diminish what a great DJ does. DJ Severe, he would same thing. He doesn't play an instrument that I know of, but when you put him on that DJ deck, he can do anything with it. Yeah, he can make 55,000 people feel a certain way. Right. Or turn up a certain emotion that's happening. Right. And a lot of that is timing and things that are musical in nature. Right. Right. But as a curator, you know, I don't think it's time to diminish that role. There are going to be plenty of old school guys who go, oh, that's not music. That's not what, mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, you hear that all the time. Sure. I mean, I'm a drummer. Right. You know, it just so happens I can also operate a drum machine. Right. Is that music? Well, guess what? It makes you dance. It's sort of like music. Yeah. So let's call it music. And there are guys who have decided to embrace and master the instrument, like Omar Hakim. Yeah. He can work the fuck out of a drum machine. (laughs) Yeah. And he is now the chair of the percussion department at Berkeley. Right. So try and call Omar Hakim. Not a drummer. Not a drummer. You know, (laughs) I mean, it it just doesn't, you don't get to happen. It's just that sometimes, you know, a farmer who gets the tractor that does the corn planting. Yeah. It doesn't make him less of a farmer. Right. That's right. You know, he's just farming on a different scale. And an old school farmer with a plow and a mule will go, oh, that guy's not. He doesn't do it the hard way. Yeah. And there's some truth to the artistry of it. But I also don't think we will ever replace the great composer. No. You know, I think what's going to happen in the AI stuff that you, just to give an explanation to our listeners, what we're talking about in AI and music is the ability for somebody to take sounds and musical phrases and assemble them into a score so hans zimmer has access to full orchestras yeah. when he needs one and do it john williams style right but he's also got raul making sounds for him and synthesizing those sounds and loading them into a sampler so that those sounds can be played like an orchestra instrument yeah so how is it different it's not but let me push that technology further mm-hmm. because now you can – so one of the things we talked about in this panel, and, and by we, I did no talking. I just did listening and, and mouth agaping. That was the verb I did. I had to cut, shut my mouth over and over again. Yeah. But they were talking about the – and this is a composer, mm-hmm. Berkeley trained composer, and mm-hmm. he's going to be on the show later on. His ability to say, I get work from Warner Brothers, and uh-huh. they say, 
garden path. 35 seconds. Yeah. I need that. Right. And so he he composes that, whether it's on a, on a laptop. And this guy's a legit. I mean, he's Berkeley, right? So he can do that. And then they're like, eh, maybe a little faster, maybe mm-hmm. a little darker, mm-hmm. maybe a little more bright. Mm-hmm. Can you do that in a minor? Like all of these kind of things come back. What he's saying is what the computer's going to be able to do is take all of those instances, uh-huh. forest path running. What's the music that's been created? Yeah, it's going to take circumstance and some adjectives. Mm-hmm. And instead of being compositional, you are going to say, these circumstances, computer, create. Mm-hmm. And the computer will, and it'll, your music is done. Right. And then you'll listen to it, and you'll make a choice. Yeah. Maybe there's 30 choices, mm-hmm. you know, like uh, with picture taking. Yep. You know, these are the filters that are applied. So it's even a step further than that, but you still have to have Diego's ear to say, that's not quite right for this particular yeah. scene, you know, if you even can see it, if you have to just visualize being on a path. Sure. Is that still composing, do you think? Sort of. Yeah. You know, you still have choices to make. Yeah. It's really, nowadays, see, there used to be gates. If you were a musician, you had to get good. Right. And you had to get good enough that you made it into a club and that the club owner would hire you right and then you would play five nights a week and if you were really good you got playing at two clubs and you started racking up hours right and then when you started to get really good at that and master that somebody would give you an opportunity to go into a studio right okay and then you would land in a studio and you would figure that out and if you were any good you got good at that yeah and then Maybe you got a recording contract. And when you got a recording contract, then you got to go into one of the big rooms. Yeah. And you got there and you started to, and then they, the record labels at the time would nurture you and they would develop you as an artist. And all of this stuff got shortcutted. Yeah. With the multi track recorder that you could set up in your basement with a drum machine and the sampler. Yeah. You know, and, and I just jumped ahead 10 steps, but. You know, first it was a multi-track recorder. You could record on a cassette and play your guitar into it yeah. and then stop and play a piano into it. And all of these technological things, people go, oh, no, no. you're going to. And what about the great producers? They're still great producers. Yeah, still great. They're still a major league. Yeah. And so what you've done is you've given more access to more people in the minor leagues. And that's what AI is going to do. Yeah. It's going to expand the minor leagues. And it's going to knock the gates down. And more people who are interested are going to be allowed to dip their toe. Yeah. And some of them are going to get pretty good at it and maybe do some things that are pretty cool. Right. But like Kanye. Yeah. You do some things with the sampler that are pretty cool. And then somebody looks at you and goes, hey, let's see if you can step that up. Yeah. Yeah. And let's see if you can make a record. This is the thing. And as you were talking, I was struck by this realization. When when young people listen to music, they're not worried about how great Brian May can shred or uh-huh. Rudolf Shanker or any of those. They're not worried about that. That's not their music. You are an old ass man pulling right? up a Rudy, Rudy Shanker. Yeah. Wow. Well, I mean, we can we can pick a more modern guy. They're not worried about what Jack. I White's think we doing. were in the room with a Dane yesterday. Yeah. You saw a Dane shredding, and so yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, is that's not their music. Dead Mouse is their music. How yeah. many instruments does Dead Mouse play when he's at a show? His instrument is that that goofy mouse hat, you know. Right. And this sound, wow. You know, like that's what he does, and he he has it queued up. So he's a world class, fantastic, and highly skilled, ten thousand plus hour guy. Mm-hmm. He's all the credit in the world, but I don't think AI scares young people. No, it doesn't. It's, I don't it, think they're it, not, and I don't I, think it should scare us. Yeah, it, it shouldn't. That's my whole point. Is yeah. like if that's where music is going, mm-hmm. then we need to trust that music, like it always has. Will and Doctor Bob would tell us the same thing. Yep, it will find its spot. Yeah, and there will absolutely be people like Quincy Jones is still going to have work. Yep. You know, got John Williams. These are old dudes, but they're still going to have work. No one's going to stay. Well, no, well there's going to be young dudes who are still going to have work. Too. Raul's going to still have Raul's work. Raul's going to still have work. Right. You know, even if you go to a guy like Pharrell, he's going to still have work right. and he's going to still be great. The reality is this 
And since we're dropping guests that have been, Phil Deckard's been on the show. Yeah. And I love Phil. And Me they, too, man. And, and I love Phil. He hit the sweet spot for what they were doing, mm-hmm. and they were right there. They had their hand on a ring. It wasn't mm-hmm. a brass ring, but they got to do that life. Yeah. And right now, within the next five years, a computer can replicate everything they did at the level they did it. Can they go play the whiskey and get a bunch of people to make out, get drunk? I don't know. Yeah. Why not? But is that what we recognize as being a great time? No. Yeah. But the people that are going to the whiskey, because I don't, I, don't, I don't go to the whiskey anymore. I know. You're talking about, you might as well be talking about people who go to the moon. Yeah. <laughs> Those guys were almost all dead. Yeah. But that's the, the whole thing is, is like, that's where the young part is. That's rock and roll. Yep. That's anti-establishment. anti-establishment. We're going to have a robot do this Well, shit. you know, what's going to happen is the robot's going to do his thing. For a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then the robot's going to become the establishment. Yeah. Because that's really what it comes down to. There are plenty of guys who can do a show with, you know, backing tracks, Mm -hmm. drum machines, and and all that. But when you're the greatest, when you're Jay-Z. Yeah. It's not good enough anymore. I'm going to make a little bit of a prediction Mm -hmm. right here. So because background music is for sure going to be one of the first areas that gets disrupted by this and people that just make a living making background music or video game music Mm -hmm. on the lower end, high end people that are going to pay high end money are still going to hire the best guys. I think silence might come into vogue as a way to create tension and music or uh-huh. like, just because it'll be some become so ubiquitous. We'll just be like, shut up. And right. then someone will say, shutting up is going to become the new, uh, that's a great prediction right. that there's going to be a film movement Yeah, where there is silence. Right. And You'll silence just be is used stuck as with a, the uh, thing. I met Ron Harris at, at the NAMM show this week and Ron Harris is an A&R guy, but was a, was a drummer before that. He'll be on the show pretty soon. But we were talking about, and just in passing, the making of a record and how it has to sound like a record. Yeah. And I I had a conversation that I hadn't had, and I want to share it with our listeners, because what what he was talking about was when a great artist, when a great artist makes a record, it sounds like a record. Yeah. And I was with Corey, Corey Jacobs. And since we're dropping show guests. Yeah. And Corey said, what do you mean by that, Ron? And he said, I don't know. But <laughs> but, but you know it when you don't hear it. Yeah. It's like porn. Yeah. That porn definition. Yeah. You're right. You do. You know it when you don't hear it. Let me use that as a transition to mm-hmm. go into the Grammy side of things because they are coming up. Well, let me, let me just reinforce Please. that point. The AI that you're talking about will eventually – be more and more in our ears mm-hmm. as you know musical scores and stuff right. for lower end things but it won't sound like Hans Zimmer it won't sound like John Williams I disagree with that 100% oh i okay you can <laughs> but it won't because that's what the difference is that's why when you hear a Mariah Carey record, it yeah. sounds like a record. Right. Because you can hear somebody sing a Mariah Carey song and go, well, that's great for a demo. Yeah. But it sounds like a demo. It doesn't sound like a record. There, I think this is what the difference is going to be with that. And we're not talking tomorrow on that. That is higher end for sure. But when a computer can beat a human and go, mm-hmm. whoop their ass in chess. Yeah. Right. Dominate. Like you yeah, we can't win. win. We can't win in chess anymore. Right. And go is more complicated than chess. Yeah. So if it's doing that, if it's figuring out, we had this conversation last night, if it's, if the guys at Stelvio Oncology are figuring out how to beat cancer with a self-learning robot that thinks in 57 dimensions, it's going to look at all the patterns of all the music that's ever been written and examine it in ways that we could never even dream of, you know, thousands of lifetimes worth of work mm-hmm. chewed up and spit out and it will be able to predict what we like right. better than we do. Did you see Finding Bobby Fisher? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Do you remember that scene in Finding Bobby Fisher where they were looking at the chessboard and the kid just stares at the chessboard and then reaches his hand out Yeah. to shake hands with the guy Yeah. and say, this is your opportunity to concede before I fuck you. Yeah. That's what the machine doesn't do. I disagree with that. The machine already knows. It knows every single it knows. game ever played. Sure. 
It knows the best move. But it doesn't look you in the eye and reach across the table oh, with its reach. hand. Yeah. You know? And that's the, the, the human piece. There is a human piece. Yes. That is going to exist way at the top end that will never be replaced. I don't know. I, I think that the economy of pushing a button, even if it costs $10,000 to buy that button, the economy to push that button and make that music in an instant mm -hmm. is going to outweigh. It'll always be button pushed music. That's fine. And the, and the line will continue to creep up. Yeah. But at the very top of the heap, there's going to be Within dude. our lifetime, that button pushed music, we won't be able to discern the difference between that and what someone else does. We already have it in language where it's very similar. Like you can go, I think you're a robot and you can get there, but you can't have that conversation with music. You just get it. You receive it. And it's based on the music that we love. It's predictive. It can do it. So it's going to reach that point. And we will enjoy the experience of the Hollywood Bowl of watching John Williams swing his arms and have a thousand French horns way more than some dude go, go. But that's only because the person that pushes that button hasn't figured out how to fill the Hollywood Bowl with emotion. And maybe they can't. Maybe that is, you know, something else, but. Yeah, there's always going to be something missing. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's always going to be something missing. I but, mean, as much as, you know, the drum machine has gotten great and yeah. you can you can play a shuffle on a drum machine, yeah. a great shuffle. Right. But you can't play it like Jeff Picaro. No, you sure and, can't. And you can, and you can program a great groove on a drum machine. And Omar Hakim does it all the time. Yeah. But it doesn't play like Omar Hakim. Well, and sometimes you got to swing a little bit. You know, sometimes, some nights, it's a little more funky than the other night. Mm -hmm. And the live performance aspect of that, you cannot get. Right. But I, mean, but I think that's what it is. It'll always vacillate between, hey, much, how much more can we do with this, with this machinery? Uh -huh. And it'll get better and better and mm -hmm. better until we get sick of it and go, yeah. okay, hold, hold on. Let's just yeah. back off of that for a little while. Yeah. And do this. I mean, yeah, you're right. New Order plays live music on stage now with actual instruments. And they played the hell out of some keyboards too, but yeah. And it had to get to that. It had to get to the point where they're they've they've taken the machines to their limit. Okay. And the limit's going to continue to creep, and that's why I support it because it's going to make music better. I love listening to Kanye West. I love listening to the Neptunes. I love Dan the Automator. I love all these guys who use machines to make music. I also love Prince. Does that ultimately allow craft work to get into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? I mean, Jesus fucking Christ. Look I what hope they so. kicked Fuck's off. Sake. Yeah. You know, they took something that wasn't supposed to work and look where it's at. Eventually, now. craft work will be looked upon properly yeah. as the godfathers of a, a, lot. a, modern, a modern interpretation yeah. of music. And I think that. The other thing that's going to happen as AI continues to move that line is that more music will become literate. How's that, Dr. Bob? What? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think it advances the art form, man. It, okay. It, I think that it advances the art form just like machinery advanced farming. Yeah. And there's going to be a steep curve. Wow. And then there's going to be, you know, there's going to be some real magic yeah. that happens. And some people are going to get left behind, and that's terrible. Yeah. But, but that always happens. Some people need to get left behind. Yeah, that always happens. Yeah. And like anything else, uh, hand carving wood, mm -hmm. right? You had to do the same thing. There's still guys hand carving There's wood. There's still guys hand. But if you want to get something pressed and put up on a wall in a theater, you might hire that guy. Yeah. But most likely, no. Not. So there's fewer of You're those. You're going to use the machine that presses out that um, mm -hmm. that Jaguar coffee table. Yeah. You know, with the or the the yeah. Black Panther the with a piece of glass sitting yes. on, its back. on its back, coffee yes. table, yeah, yeah. But there is a guy that's going to do it. Will mm -hmm. he do it as good as that guy back in Renaissance Italy? No, no, because that that's a different time. No, but there's going to be some millionaire who says, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. I want you to go get a slab of granite. Yeah, and I want you to, you know, and and, and the the that will still him. exist. Yeah. Now, how many guys don't get to be cobblers, or how many? Yeah. Well, Who fuck. wants to be a fucking cobbler? That's, yeah, that's too bad. But guess what? You don't have to be a cobbler. How many people don't have to be farmers anymore? Yeah. You know, all the way back to full circle. So let's do that transition over to the Grammys because I do want to have the conversation. Okay. About 
First off, Alison Krauss, 27 Grammys. Every time I relearn that fact. Jesus, man. And that's how incredible she's like, I have to relearn it. Yeah. Like, I, I, I realize that I know it, but then I, 27 Grammys. How familiar are you with Alison Krauss's work? I would say I'm passively familiar. Yeah. You know, I know her voice when I hear it. Mm. I think I know her sound, but I might get her confused with somebody similar. But yeah, I, I know when she's around. Yeah. I'm ashamed to say I, I really don't know much of her work. You know, when I hear something and somebody says, that's Alison Krauss, I go, yeah, that's really good. But I just haven't taken the time. And I'm not saying I'm going to take the time. I don't know if I am or not. Right. But but you definitely, she is great. Yeah. And she's got 27 Grammys. And she messes around. So Quincy has 27 Grammys, but he makes all music. She's got as many Grammys as Quincy Jones. Mm-hmm. That means she puts all of her peers in a stranglehold. Uh huh. And the Grammys. And they don't get to. Right. And the Grammys are like, we don't want to give it to Allison again. Jesus yeah. Christ. But right. there she is, like undeniable. Yeah. So that's impressive. Not that Quincy's stuff is not impressive, but to be an artist working against your peers and taking them to it. Doesn't matter what your genre is, if it's jazz or if it's a solo performance on vocals or whatever it's going to be. She goes out, and if you get on the mat with her, you're going to be uh, gasping for air. <laughs> And she's going to have her bicep around your throat. Yeah. Well, yeah, that, I would say that <laughs> Allison Krauss is the Hicks and Gracie yeah. uh, of music. She just, you can't, like you said, do you, how does how this leg get up here? Yeah. What am I supposed to do about right. this? Yeah. And then when the Grammy voters are looking, they're saying, well, look at her leg get up there. Like mm -hmm. everybody knows it's coming. Everybody mm -hmm. trains against it. Right. And then it still happens. Still happens. By the way, I want to say this before we leave this topic altogether. Ampermusic.com. Check those guys out. They're going to make it possible for it. No, no ad. I'm just one of the, the people I learned about. And we'll have them on the show or I'm popping the bubble. Those guys are making it so that if you don't have a literate music background, you will be able to make music. It's incredible. Back to uh, Alison Krauss and her, uh, her arm snapping triangle choking techniques. so now if you're allison Krauss and yeah. you move away from and i'm not at all uh saying that she's well let's face it she's in a very specific um you know category that she makes music for and to compare her to quincy jones you know he's I don't know what his first Grammy nomination was. It was a long time ago. But it was a long time ago. It could very well have been for Frank Sinatra. It could very well have been for Count Basie. Yeah. So the thing about the difference between the, the two of them is that when you look at his, how many times has he been nominated? Uh, like almost 90. It's like 87. If you think about 87 Grammy nominations. I think there's been 90 Grammy shows. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's, you're looking at a career that spans many years, but yeah. it still means that every single year he produced something that got multiple Grammy nods. Right. That's what that math looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Because the Grammys are basically as old as he is. Mm -hmm. And he didn't start getting nominated when he was two. Right. So, yeah. So if, if, so if you, cram that into 20 fewer years right then you get a body of work that has just been you know has grown from terrific to masterful right this episode of the break it down show is brought to you by lions rock productions that's us we publish evaluate and develop podcasts just like this one consult others to build their own and create associated content and content marketing strategies so if you're launching or expanding your social media presence your business or your personal brand or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level reach out to us on twitter at p day turner or at john lg 69 at the break it down show there's a thousand ways to get a hold of us now enjoy the show. Yeah, it's it's an incredible thing to be able to do that. And that's there there is no we, we talked on Jay Moore's show and we were talking about um, you know, the goat and all that kind of stuff. The mm -hmm. guy that comes before the goat is zero with. Yeah. Because first is great. Yep. But you'll never be better than Quincy Jones. And yeah. he doesn't have to pull his resume out. No. He's it's just over with him. He's yeah. zero with. And the other guys can be zero with too, but He's in that class where you you can't have a career like that. Yeah. You never can. No. You can hope to work for him. Yep. And that's that's it. really what it is. Yeah. You're going to try to apprentice 
in his presence so that you can gain some of that wisdom and go do something phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. He's our Haydn of our time. Yeah. You know, where you work under him or you work under the guy that worked under him. Yeah. And that's Incredible. often great. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's how we got to Bill Belichick. You know, he yep. studied under Bill Walsh and the guys that come out from, the, you know, those coaching trees exist for a reason. It's the same thing. When, when we talk about greatness, I know there's a lot of criticism against the Grammys for their selection of, of music and everything. And there's an article we were looking at this morning in the Washington Post, and they're talking about mistakes made. And they talked about the album of the year in 1980. <clears throat> Billy Joel won for 52nd Street. Okay. What didn't win mm. was Off the Wall from Michael Jackson. Mm-mm-mm. Minute by minute from the Doobie Brothers. Uh-huh. You can barely say it without laughing because it's just such strong albums. The Gambler, which we both admitted we don't have a whole strong uh, mastery over. And, and there are four really, really good songs um, on that. By the way, Steve Gibb wrote She Believes in Me. I didn't realize that. But uh, that's a strong selection of albums. I can't fault them for picking 52nd Street. Uh, Yeah. I agree. I can't either. I mean, it had some great songs on it. Big Shot, My Life. Uh-huh. Uh huh. I don't know. It's hard to say because you also have the time. You have to realize that these these uh, albums that won were voted on by people. Right. And people had a certain sentiment at that time about certain things and certain artists. And that always plays into that. That dynamic exists. So, you know, now I can tell you how I feel about 52nd Street now. And I can tell you how I feel about Off the Wall now. Yeah. And about both of those artists now. But I wasn't around to vote for those in 1980. I mean, I, I was alive, but not, you know. I was in a voting Naris member. I'm not now and wasn't then. <laughs> so, you know, it, we have retrospect now. Yeah. And when we try to criticize these guys, look at the albums that were winning in that era. Sgt. Pepper's, Glenn Campbell's By the Time I Get to Phoenix, mm. Blood, Sweat, and Tears, Blood, Sweat, and Tears. Yeah. Then Simon and Garfunkel went in one. Carol King went in one. Let me know when I get to someone who's slouching. Right. The concert for Bangladesh album that- Oh, uh, George Harrison. Yeah. 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 And then three of the next four years are owned. This is album of the year. Hmm. Three of the next four years are owned by Stevie Wonder. Of course. Paul Simon sneaked in one during that time. Mm-hmm. By the way, uh, Phil Ramone was a big part of that album. His name comes up again here in a moment. Then Fleetwood Mac Rumors. Oh, God. I, I, you know, <laughs> yeah, just powerhouse records. Saturday Night Live or Saturday Night Fever soundtrack. Yeah, was was the next one, and then Billy Joel mm-hmm. came in and Fifty Second Street. So if someone's got a problem with any of those albums, oh. they got a problem with, with the Grammys getting it right too. Yeah, there's not a, there's not a racial thing. The only thing you could say is is there maybe aren't enough women, but th- in that time, there just weren't that many opportunities for women to make that album. Yeah. That hadn't happened yet. Right. But that's – if I don't buy into the racial dialogue. Yeah, I don't on. like the diversity conversation when it comes to that. And right. even uh, – I love Natalie Portman sure. but to comment about how there aren't too few women directors. Well, maybe this year this many women directors didn't make – I get that there are have been few opportunities sure. and, that we're trying to get better at that. And that's how we move the needle by calling attention to it and nudging it and nudging it. But – and making it okay yeah. to say, hey, women, hey, minorities, you know, and we always, I, you know, I always applaud guys like Melvin Van Peebles and stuff who kick the door down for minorities to go to work in the arts. But that we have, that we can be retrospective about these things. When you look at 52nd Street next to Off the Wall, Quincy Jones brought an army to record off the wall. Yeah, he came in, he came in swinging and I love Billy Joel's work and I love Liberty DeVito. Um, but I don't know that those two albums are, I think, mm, again, I love Liberty DeVito, but I think off the wall is just stronger. When we look back at it, you know, it had, there were more, there were more songs that knocked your socks off. But in that time, 
Yeah. In that time, though. Yeah. You know, I'm, that's what I'm saying is we know that now oh, okay, because because we've had time. Yeah. Yeah. And we look back at those songs that Rod Temperton wrote and, and that and that Quincy brought the army in for. Right. And we go, Jesus, man. You know, it's yeah. easier to see now, <laughs> you know, why uh, why we won the Battle of Gettysburg or whatever. Right. Then at the time, being able to predict who wins that. Yeah. The other thing is, is the genres that they're playing in. Mm -hmm. You know, Michael's album comes after funk had transitioned sort of into disco. And we'd already had Saturday Night Fever soundtrack hit. So it's like, well, you know, we already have this sound. Billy Joel already had this other great album. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much time to reward this guy's hard work because he's still making great stuff. Yeah, that's one of the things about the feeling of the artist and the feeling of the time. Right. Was that Billy Joel was due. Yeah. And Michael Jackson was new. Right. And it was like, well, we know Michael Jackson's got a bright future ahead of him. He's got the right guy. And we know we've already nominated Quincy Jones for 47 of these things. Right. So those guys we don't have to worry about. Let's go ahead and acknowledge this beautiful piece of work. And let's keep these coming. There's different reasons why albums win, too. Uh, right after Billy Joel, Christopher Cross won. And he just captured New York in a way that no one had. A yeah. singular great moment with a mm -hmm. couple of songs that you have to sing. It's super catchy. Yeah. You wouldn't put the album, wouldn't have won the year before. No. But New York had a moment. It went from the Bee Gees to Billy Joel to Christopher Cross. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, well, this is New York's moment. And yeah. then that time passed. And so to not be New York during that time, also to your disadvantage. Yeah. But now if you take that Christopher Cross album and mm -hmm. put it up next to any of the winners from the previous five years. Yeah. You know, those those are the ones that have stood the test of time. That Christopher Cross album. Who listens to that now? Nobody. I mean, I can say I've listened to Off the Wall uh -huh. in the last five days. Yeah. You know, or some sure. song off. I mean, it it resurfaces in my Pandora. It resurfaces. I hear that shit all the time. When you look at the albums that Christopher Cross beat, Glass Houses by Billy Joel. Yeah. Pink Floyd, The Wall. Come on. And then- uh, Come on. Yeah. Frank, Frank Sinatra did a trilogy of past, present, future, and then mm. Barbara Streisand did Guilty. So he beat legitimate people, but he captured the zeitgeist. Yeah. He's like, I'm going to put this in a box. You yeah. Know, you know, when you're stuck between the moon and New York City, you're like, yeah, the best you can do is fall in love. Like, oh, everybody that year got married to that song. Yeah. You know, and that's what makes the difference. Look at the next guy that won next year. John Lennon won yeah. for Double Fantasy. Mm -hmm. And I know Oko's, you know, Oko's on that. Yoko Ono's on that album as well. But if John Lennon She wasn't alive, doing the heavy lifting. Right. If John Lennon's alive, does that album win? I, I don't know. Yeah. But that Yeah, it's hard to say. And it's not that he, he won because he died, but that certainly didn't hurt. You know, it's like, right. man, this is our last chance. This is his. Yep. This is his thing. This is the last song he's ever going to sing. Yeah. I want to say, um, well, okay, that's great that uh, that he won that. But I want to say that, yeah, he definitely benefited from his passing. There was this very strong sentiment and a very strong resurgence of the love for his body of work yeah. that happened at that time that allowed him to win. When I... Worked at Mix. We were talking about when I worked at Mix last night with uh, with our new buddy, the Wesonator. Um, Christopher C Cross owned uh, an SSL console that he had in his studio at his house. And this SSL console, when you see pictures of a recording studio and you see this piece of fucking gargantuan furniture with 128 rows of EQ and fader that looks like a space command center. Mm -hmm. That's what he had in his house. Yeah. An SSL console that he might have paid $100,000 for. And he was selling it. And so he put an added mix for his SSL console. I don't, I didn't follow up or anything. I don't know if he ever sold it, but I just thought it was uh, pretty interesting that I answered the phone one day and it was Christopher Cross and he wanted to put an ad mix because he was selling his SSL console. Um, so, if our listeners out there include the guy who bought Christopher Cross, Christopher Cross's SSL console, and by the way, in the ad, the ad he specified like this is Christopher Cross's console. So, 
if you're the guy who bought his uh his SSL board, uh please ping us. I want I'm curious to know what happened to that thing. Curious to know where it went, how you got it there and all that stuff. Yeah, that's always Cuz that's a, one of those things that you move in a shipping container. Yeah, and you have to get it out. Yeah. And then you have to get it in of everything along yeah. the way. How do we get this into the shipping container? <laughs> sometimes it involves putting it in a place uh-huh. and then building the room around it. And sometimes, you know, it always involves a guy with all of his fingers splayed saying, it's delicate. It's delicate. <laughs> Don't yeah. bump it. And he's got his hands out and he's imploring you. <laughs> I just got a, uh, I just got a text from Kaylee Moyer. Mm-hmm. She's a brilliant uh, drummer from... Nashville, I think, is where she really started her career, uh, although I think she's from somewhere else before that. But um, she played – I saw her yesterday on the uh, John Hammond funk experience or something. Mm-hmm. John Hammond's got a – John Hammond's always got a band, and he's got a band now called the Funk – Army, Funk Foundation, Funk Experience, something like that. You know, it's John Hammond is funky. And he's got Kaylee Moyer on the drums. She just confirmed that she'd love to be on the show. Nice. Nice. That is So, fantastic. right on. And if you don't know Kaylee Moyer, uh, you should get to know her. She's a good drummer. I want, to, I want to go back to this Grammy thing for Album of the Year stuff. Just to, to put a pin in all of these things. Billy Joel continued to get nominated for the next couple of years just uh-huh. because he put out great stuff. You know, but he only won that one time. Mm. Who he lost to, Christopher Cross, John Lennon, Toto came in, mm. and they did Toto 4, which he got a problem with they that. They won with one. Toto 4, yeah. Mm-hmm. You, you can't have a problem with that. And mm-hmm. then Thriller, and then Lionel Richie. See, okay, Thriller is Thriller. Yeah. And everybody knows the greatness of the Thriller album. But I think that in that case, um, Maybe if we're just going pound for pound, yeah. that Michael Jackson should have won the first one and Billy Joel should have won the second one. But the times didn't reflect that. Yeah, it didn't. You're right. And then the other albums nominated the year the Thriller won was Let's Dance. Oh, my God. And I'm telling you, David Bowie never got there. He never got there. He never got there. And Let's Dance was so good. Yeah. That's the Speaking peak of, of that Omaha genre, too. Yeah. yeah. And then there's uh, Innocent Man from Billy Joel. Oh. How about, how about Synchronicity? Wow. Yeah. Like, if I really could go back, that, for me, would be the album that yeah. beats out Thriller. Thriller's wonderful, world-class. And if you want to pick Thriller, I'm not going to argue sure. with you. Yeah. But Synchronicity. That's the year that you can't, you just can't call it. No, huh? The Flashdance soundtrack. But, you that, know, yeah. that's, that, that gets to be what it is. But as, as soundtracks go, that was terrific. Yeah, for sure. But uh, that soundtrack got its ass whooped by the rest of the list. Yeah. <laughs> that soundtrack was not going to win. Lionel Richie can't slow down. Phil Collins, No Jacket Required. Paul Simon, Graceland. You two, Joshua Tree. Good George God. Michael, Faith. <gasps> Let me breathe in. <sighs> that all happened in 1984? No, no, no. That's the next oh, two I was albums say. that won. Yeah. All those albums won. But, oh, like, you're going chronologically. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I I just, yeah those are the next winners. So, so, yeah, you worked your way up to Faith, which was 1980. Yeah. So, can't, Seven, yeah, can't slow down Lionel Richie. No Jacket Required. Phil Collins. Graceland. Paul Simon. Simon, U2, Josh, which we, George Michael, Faith, then Bonnie Raitt, Nick of Time. Bonnie Raitt is the next one where you're like, oh, how'd, how'd she get it? But she got in there because she had done 25,000 hours to get right. there. And it was like, it's time to, you know. It was time to, to honor her. Right, right. That she, was like her comeback record, too. Yeah, yeah. That was the one that had something to talk about on it. Right. That record was really, really good. <laughs> And it was, it yeah. called attention. It would be like if Meryl Streep had been a sleeper all this time. Right. And then fell out with, you know, I don't know, pick whatever Meryl Streep piece of work you want her to fall out with. But that was what it was, was us looking at Bonnie Raitt and going, how have we slept on Bonnie Raitt all right. this time? And this goes back to that bigger conversation to 1980, because mm-hmm. the nominees from that year for Bonnie Raitt were End of the Innocents with Don Hanley. Oh. Fine Young Cannibals. And that was really their best album, The Raw and the Cooked. The Raw Cooked, yeah. yeah. I'm going to say this one. Traveling Wilburys, Volume 1. Okay. Which is a super, super. solid. Yeah. Yeah. And Full Moon Fever. Wow. Yeah. So you could say, oh, Full Moon Fever should have won. Yeah. But no, you can't. No, you can't. Because Bonnie Raitt had been there, and then That's she right. blew the door down. None of these guys blew the door down. Tom Petty wouldn't have said that. Right. Tom Petty would have said, oh, no, no. Yeah. I can't go up against Bonnie Raitt. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And so, it was... So that was ni- 90, 90. 90. 
That was straight 90. Up, straight up 90. Okay. Yeah. So here's the thing about, about that to put, to give it some context. In 1987, in the fall of 1987, Bonnie Raitt played at the Talk of the Town in Vallejo. Wow. So her career went from Talk of the Town in Vallejo, which is a fucking dive. Right. To, which is a dive bar in a dive town. Yeah. And two years later. Yeah. Her record wins the Grammy for album of the year. She was writing songs for that album yeah. right then. And that was, f- and those gigs were fueling that record. Yeah. Those gigs were fueling her saying, Oh no, mm-hmm. I'm not fucking standing for this shit right. anymore. I'm coming out swinging. And then just to take this era thing a Good little for further. Bonnie Raitt. We love you, Bonnie. Absolutely. Raitt. Yeah. Boy, please come on the show. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Uh, then Quincy Jones won. You have to do that whole show because I'm just going to be in a warm embrace <laughs> with Bonnie Raitt, and I'm just going to go, Bonnie, I love you so much. Yeah, and we're just going to say, Bonnie Raitt, ready, go. Yeah, and then she's going to talk. Quincy Jones won the next year for Back on the Block. Really? Yeah, I didn't know Back on the Block won. And he beat, uh, but seriously, Phil Collins, Mariah Carey's Mariah Carey, mm. Please Hammer, Don't Hurt Him, mm. produced by our man James Early. Yeah, and I guess we should say also, uh, show guest Felton Pilot. Yep. And then Wilson Phillips, Wilson Phillips. Not a super strong year, and there's nothing wrong back on the block. But mm-hmm. then the effect of Bonnie Ray comes in, and then the next few winners are Natalie Cole, Eric Clapton Unplugged, Whitney Houston, The Bodyguard, Tony Bennett Unplugged, Alanis Morissette, Celine Dion, Lauren Alanis Hill. Morissette was the reset button. That easily could be. Yeah. But you got these women that like the women broke through and started getting recognized for their, their work. And it's it's interesting to see that a lot of old things came back into play because Eric Clapton got one with Unplugged. Bob Dylan got one from Time Out of Mind. Oh, the Eric Clapton Unplugged. You know what? This is – if we have to look – one of the things about this show that we always talk about is, you know, it's hard work doing this show. We put a lot of time into doing this show. And thank you, listeners, for, for listening because we love that. We spend a lot of time on this show. Yeah. But as you go through that list, a lot of the people who have had an impact on us musically on our lives yeah. have been on the show. <laughs> right. You know, you just ran through a bunch of records that a bunch of people we know played on. Yeah. So, yeah. <clears throat> I mean, and to, and of course, what made me think of that was as you're talking about James and Felton and guys like that, and you land on, uh, what was it you landed on? Uh, oh, Eric, Cal- Eric Clapton Unplugged, Unplugged yeah. that Nathan played on. Yeah. So, and we get to say things like that Nathan played on. Right. And we're talking about Nathan East. We were surrounded last night at that Yamaha thing. Yeah. And the band started to come out on the stage. And we went, oh, Nate's playing. Yeah. That's our buddy. That's our pal. <laughs> and then the you know crowd around us started to look up at the stage and go, oh, Nathan East and Genuflect, as they should. Right. But we were like, oh, yeah, there's Nate. Yeah. Hey, Nate. Yeah. I guess the the biggest point of this conversation is is the albums that win album of the year, mm-hmm. by and large, are wonderful albums. And sure. you can fault the Academy, but you also have to understand the context of the time. You know, I, I get why in ninety eight Bob Dylan wins, partly because time out time out of mind time out of mind is great, but also because they're like, you know what, we we've done all this work. Uh, He's like the greatest American poet alive right now, you know, male at least. It's time to make sure we check the block for him, you know? Yeah. Well, I think one of the reasons that Back on the Block won, because Back on the Block, not my favorite Quincy Jones record. Right. You know? Uh, I think certainly if a piece of work by Quincy needed to win as a solo album, uh, I go back to the dude. I mean, I even like Q's juke joint, but... Back on the block, eh, it's just okay. But it also was the last studio recording that Sarah Vaughn made. Right. And I think Ella Fitzgerald, too. I think that's right. So when you got that going for you, that's a continuation of the Bonnie Raitt, hey, we better acknowledge these greats right. syndrome. Yeah, she definitely opened the door for let's get some of these older people that haven't been recognized and mm-hmm. let's get some of these women in here. She blew that all down and we started seeing, you know, Lauren Hill became a possibility. Yeah. You know, she reached greatness that one time. Yep. But Tony Bennett, <laughs> yeah, he definitely deserved it. Yeah. Uh, Whitney Houston, Jesus, you know, like at that point she hadn't won 
well, the, it was time with the bodyguard. Yeah. That was really, really turned out to be the peak of her career, probably. It really did. I mean, you could go to, uh, let's say, what was the club? Like, if you're walked into the club and the band wasn't playing yet, and you were just listening to the music in the club, you could walk into a place like Kimball's or Yoshi's, uh-huh. or you could walk through Ralph's yeah. in the middle of the night looking for eggs. Yeah. And hear the, you know, I will always love you. Yeah. And hell, I just, you know, I'm just glad also that Tolly Parton made a big pile of money. Man. Off of I that. I'm sure Parton. she, I'm sure she loved that that record was so good as well. Yeah. So let's ease up on the Grammys a little okay. bit. You know, like the yeah. people that complain about it and, and want to, that's great. You're doing, actually doing the Grammys a great favor. You're mm-hmm. talking about talking their work, about them. Yeah. but they're not missing. But quit fucking play or hating. Yeah. I mean, these guys are, these guys are monsters. Mm-hmm. I they're was, all monsters. Yeah, absolutely. When Taylor Swift wins, she wins because she's fucking good. Yeah. You know, Kendrick Lamar, did he deserve to win? She, yes. To Pimp a Butterfly is fantastic. Yeah. But, he deserved it. Yeah, absolutely. He deserved to get the nomination. You know, all these, all these bands. That was the... I think, see, this is what I'm talking about when there's cyclical stuff happening and why we should be, embrace AI and what it's going to do. Mm-hmm. Because that was, Kendrick Lamar winning was the Grammy saying, okay, enough of the old guys. Let's acknowledge some of this new stuff that's Kendrick coming Lamar in. Kendrick Lamar did Taylor strong. Swift won that year. Oh, Taylor Swift won that year. Well, same thing. Same, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 1989 I mean, there was, was a great album. A lot of uh, new artists who... Had really strong records. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, so again, yeah. Let's. So let's, thank you, Naris. Yeah, th- <laughs> thank you, Grammys. Thank you, Grammys. Uh, this year, by the way, because I have to get, I have to check the mark here. The nominees for album of the year are four 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 for a four forty four by Jay Z, mm-hmm. Damn by Kendrick Lamar, Melodrama by Lord, Twenty Four K Magic by Bruno Mars, uh-huh. and Awaken My Love by Childish Gambino. Wow. I don't know anything about Awaken My Love. That's a lot of hip hop. That's a lot of hip hop. That's a lot of strong music. Um, Just on reading those names, I have two comments. One, U2 is not in there Mm -hmm. with a great album. So definitely the genres have turned. Mm -hmm. Probably irrelevant. Maybe they give them one more for like a body of work, great album of the year Grammy, but not this year Mm -hmm. with a very strong album. I think they can still come back and make. Oh, yeah. They still are making. Look, man, when it comes to U2. Uh, I give you a hard time for liking them as much as you do. <laughs> and the thing about them is, though, that they have endured a music business that has given them everything that they wanted. Yeah. And that ruins a lot of people, and it certainly ruins a lot of bands. Yeah. And they've made it through all of that bullshit. Yeah. They, they made it so hard that they got good at having made it. Yeah. And not everybody can master that because so few people have been there that there's no manual for that. Right. It's like being a wonderful president of the United States. You get to that job and you go, holy shit, how can anybody do this? Right. This is ridiculous. And then you get good at it. How do you get good at that shit? Yeah. So that's what U2 has done is that they've continued to make a better record than the last record. And every record is so good. How do you get better? Well, you get better because the guys circle the wagons and they take all the ego out of it yeah. and they take and they eliminate all the bullshit and they go, look, you're good at this and you're good at this and you're good at this. Let's all get a little better at that craft. And you don't have Larry Mullen standing up and going, well, I want to be a solo artist and I think I can. No, mm-hmm. I'm going to lay back in this cut and I'm going to figure out how to be better at that. Yeah. You guys go do your thing, and when we reconvene, I'm going to bring you something fresh and new in this trade. Right. And then we're going to put it all together and see if we can't do this shit again even better than we did last time. How do you continue to do that year over year over year? When was the U2 year where we went, holy shit, those guys have fallen off. Yeah. I think they're feuding. (laughs) You know, can you imagine? It would be like if the police got along. Right. Look at what a great prolific amazing band that was that lived for a short amount of time because they couldn't keep the shit together yeah yeah the new album is excellent and one of the things that you have to give credit for is adam and larry stay out of the way 
uh-huh. and they let the guys that write the music write the music. And I'm not saying anything negative out there playing because what Adam brings his bass lines in, there's all kinds of bass lines that he has. And you're like, that's that's Adam Clayton. Yeah. And I, I've already been played before. That's a hook in the song. Like that, he is a master of that. Yep. But the other two dudes, when Bono finds that voice, and on this album, it's it's songs of experience. Like they knew they wanted to write this album, and they started talking to their younger selves, thinking about what's the last song I'll ever sing. What would I write? Mm-hmm. And they talk about reducing ego. They talk about just you know what, get over yourself and create this stuff. I should have started earlier and create. Like these are the thoughts of middle aged people. You know, I should do this. He's imploring us to get ahead. He's imploring us to like look at inequality in in, in people around the world. You know, like he always has. Syria, where all that hate in Libya, right? Libya is a 90 minute flight from Rome. Wow. And when you think about it in those contexts and those guys saying, you got to pay attention to this. Why are we not figuring this out? Why are there, why is there, you know, harvesting of alive humans, organs, Mm -hmm. you know, in that place like that? So, to give that context, yeah, I took a ninety minute flight to come down here, yeah, right. It's that far, yeah, Oakland and, to Long Beach, right ninety minutes, and it's just Rome incredible. to Syria, ninety minutes, right. That's what they do that's even greater than that. You care about the mothers of the disappeared, you know, the women that lost their sons in South America because you two said so, yeah. You care about female inequality because U2 says so. Yeah. So not only do they nail down the music part, but Bono's are conscious. And if we paid attention to what he said and where he puts his real work, yeah. there's five years between albums because those guys are doing other things. That's how they get along. Yeah. It's time to go write an album. Okay? That's true too. And what did you bring this time? Right. And they've all come with something that they... Let me tell you the tale of the time I went to this village. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's a song. Yeah. You know, and then they do it. That crumbs from our table from the 2000s is a song about that. So that's one of the things that really no other band in history has done, at least at that level. And it's incredible. Uh, and they're not nominated this year. But I do want to say that, that that Songs of Experience album is fantastic. And every time I listen to it, it gets better. Bruno Mars's album is mm-hmm. a monster. That's a good album. Here's what here's what my I, favorite song on that album is Perm. Is it really? Yeah, I love that song. <laughs> I, I'm gonna shut up and let you talk because I dominated a little bit there, but No, that's 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 good, man. That's a good reflection. Here's what I want to say about the albums that are out there right now. And this goes all the way back to the AI thing. When you look at the writers for the songs in this album, the first name on every one is Mars. Mm. I love Kendrick Lamar. Former guest, Stuart Copeland, said yeah. he's the one that's pushing music in a new direction. Yeah. But Bruno plays, performs, sings, writes. And for me, I'm going to always default to that, even if there is a robot making it. Not that Kendrick is a robot making music. But that's where my that's where my favoritism is going to be. Yeah. I don't care about gender. I don't care about race. You know, I care about the amazing talent multifaceted talent that Bruno Mars brings to anything. This is the guy that sang that cheesy grenade song. Look what he's doing now. Yeah. And that cheesy grenade song is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it was just this schmaltzy and everything else. He, oh my God, just it's fantastic. Okay. Well, this has been quite a recap show. I'm not sure what we recapped because we had, we had a lot, we went into this thing. With the intention of kind of catching our audience up, uh, which we will do. But I think... Three shows a week. Yeah. That's big news. Jesus. Maybe four, because we're producing so many oh shows. Oh, my God. It just made my back hurt. <laughs> That's a lot, man. That's a lot. Is. That's what players do. Yeah. That's true. So, anyway, we, we love you guys. Thank you for your support. And uh, keep listening and comment and let us know what you think and we'll keep doing it and get ready because Mark Valley's show is coming out in about a month oh man yeah and it's cool it's yeah. hella cool if you like spy stuff this is your show mm-hmm. yeah listen to that it's called the live drop anyway uh, thanks everybody hey I'm Pete A. Turner on Twitter and I'm John LG 69 on Twitter reach out seriously we want to talk to you guys hit us up 